If you would like to follow along in the reading of the scriptures this morning, if you would turn to Psalm 21. Psalm 21. A psalm which uh, was written by David. Um, I'm not sure of the particular time in his life, although it does appear at this time that he is king over Israel. But I want us to bear in mind that as I read this, oftentimes many of the psalms are, are looking beyond the immediate author and his circumstances and looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the way we want to understand this this morning. Psalm 21, let me read for you the 13 verses. David writes, O Lord, in your strength the king will be glad, and in your salvation how greatly he will rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire, and you have not withheld the request of his lips. For you meet him with the blessings of good things. You set a crown of fine gold on his head. He asked life from you. You gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you place upon him. For you uh, make him most blessed forever. You make him joyful with gladness in your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. And through the loving kindness of the Most High, he will not be shaken. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord will swallow them up in His wrath and fire will devour them. Their offspring you will destroy from the earth and their descendants from among the sons of men. Though they intended evil against you and devised a plot, they will not succeed. For you will make them turn their back. You will aim with your bowstrings at their faces. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. Well, as you know, I've, and as I've already made several references to this morning, Election Day will soon be upon us. And if you've been following the, uh, you know, the debates and reading the platforms of the various candidates, you, you'll know that there is a reason for us to be concerned. Because even the most conservative on the ballot is still far from what he should be as a godly leader of this nation or any nation. Uh, the Lord has not really chosen to raise up a godly man, a, a truly righteous candidate, for some time. Now, I know it may be shocking to some of you, but we need to understand that perhaps compared one to another, one might actually shine above the other the way that their platform is worded. It may sound like a very righteous thing, but we do need to understand by God's standards, all of the candidates fall terribly short. Because really the standard is the standard he gives to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us obviously fall short of that. But I mean even among men who would be qualified to have an office this high in our nation. Uh, we need someone, or at least we should desire someone, and certainly God would desire this of a candidate that he fears the Lord more than men, and that he would be willing to do all of God's will, even if he should face the ire of the entire leadership of this nation. Now realizing, again, the idea that uh, a truly righteous king of what, what he is, we should see that in David. David is often pointed to as a, as a righteous king, one who was a man after God's own heart, one who made sure that he was doing what God wanted him to do, and one who was making sure that the nation was doing what God wanted them to do. Now again, let me ask you, do either of the candidates represent that kind of man? We do need to be careful because when it comes to election day and we cast that vote, we need to remember that we are going to be partly responsible for the actions of the man we vote for if he should get into office. There may be particular aspects of their platform that we enjoy or, or that we like, that we resonate with, but we do need to remember that we're voting for the whole package, aren't we? We're voting for everything he stands for, and when he gets into that office and he begins to act upon those principles that he's already expressed, unrighteous principles, that we are going to be those that he is acting for if we are the ones who have voted him into office. Now, I say these things, of course, to make us aware of, of what we're going to be doing when we come to election time, and perhaps it's a little bit early for that, 
because we'll probably forget what I had to say this morning and what we see from God's Word before we come in, into that time frame. But I do want us from this to begin to look forward to that and to begin to consider what it is that we ought to be doing before that time comes. The first thing is seriously to pray before we cast our vote. We need to make sure that we can do it with a good conscience before God and that we don't sin before Him uh, by our votes. And secondly, earnestly, by looking at the condition of our nation, by understanding what it is that these men are going to do when they get into office, to pray that God would send revival. And this isn't something that we should pray for once, pray for twice, a couple of weeks, and then give up when we don't see it happening. This is something we need to earnestly devote our whole lives to doing. This is something that uh, the church has prayed for for years, some for a whole generation, never seen any answer to that prayer, and yet the church in the future seeing the answers to those prayers that were made in the past because God has His sovereign timetables. We need to pray that God would so pour out of His Spirit upon the earth and upon this nation in particular that a time would come when, when the candidates that we have now would never even be considered for office because of their ignorance, because of their immaturity, in some cases because of their downright wickedness. They wouldn't even be considered for office. The Lord is able to do that. The Lord did that in times in the past. He can certainly do that in the present if it is His will. We need to pray that God would be merciful to us and pour out of His Holy Spirit. But there is one more thing that the consideration of these things should cause us to do, and that is to thank God that He has given to us a man after His own heart, to the church in particular and to the earth as a whole, a king who loves righteousness and justice, one who will carry out his whole will and one who actually does, one who overrules the actions of all men, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I do want us to see that this doesn't excuse us from our responsibility to pray and to ask God for revival. It doesn't excuse us in our culpability when we vote to make sure that we vote for a righteous candidate or anything else we might do in this connection but it does give us the confidence that when we have done our duty in seeking everything that we should in righteous leaders, that the Lord is still going to accomplish His holy will through the one who is elected because there is one who rules over Him, who holds the hearts of all men in His hands, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it is the Lord Jesus that we want to consider from our passage here this morning. I've already told you this psalm does apply to David first, who wrote it. He writes about his own experiences as king, the Lord's goodness to him, the Lord standing up to protect him and his kingdom against all of his enemies. Certainly all of those things are true, but we do need to see as well that it goes beyond this. David was a prophet as well as a king, and in this psalm he speaks prophetically of the Lord Jesus Christ. David was also a type of Christ in many ways, not the least of which as king over God's people. And because of this, there are many parallels between what God has done for David and what he has done for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he continues to do for him in his ruling and reigning over his kingdom and over all of his creation. The Lord has given to us a perfect king. He has given to us a godly king one who is ruling and reigning over the earth with absolute power, and one whom he has promised one day to subdue all of his enemies under his feet. I'm not sure I put that grammatically correctly, but the idea is that God has given to us a king who is ruling and reigning in righteousness, and the Father is currently, and between now and the time Christ comes again, subduing his enemies under his feet, conquering them. Though as a nation we don't deserve a righteous king, God has given to us a king who rules over this nation, whether they like it or not, and rules over the church and over the whole world, working everything to the good of his people. So this morning we're not going to consider how this psalm applies to David in particular as much as how it applies to Christ as an encouragement to us. And what I want us to see are three things. First of all, the blessings that have come to us through the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, the blessed hope 
that one day everything will be subjected to Christ and finally what our response should be to Christ's kingship. Well, first of all, we see the blessings that are ours through the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see this in the things that David writes regarding himself. But these things, of course, apply as well to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, first of all, in verse 1, O Lord, in your strength the king will be glad, and in your salvation how greatly he will rejoice. David here is writing not only of his own experience, but also of Christ's in his trust of God, in God's strength, and in his joy over the work of salvation that he sent Christ into the world to perform. Now the first thing that's interesting here is that we don't often think about it, but when the Lord Jesus Christ became a man, when the Son of God became a Son of Man, he took upon himself in every way the limitations of a man. He became like us in every sense of the word, accepting sin which means that as a man he had to rely upon his Father and the strength of his Spirit as a man in order to do his work. And so he did. And he rejoiced in the fact that his Father was there. His Father strengthened him to do this work and allowed him to accomplish this. Gave him the protection that was necessary to carry out his will until it was done. That is, the work of his redemption. And even during his betrayal, even during his arrest and his trial, his crucifixion and his death, Jesus trusted in the Father and in his strength and relied upon it. And Jesus was not disappointed. The Father was with him. The Father upheld him. The Father took his soul to be with him in glory when he yielded up at death. And, of course, he raised him again from the dead during, in, well, after those three days had elapsed. Christ trusted in the strength of his Father and he was not disappointed. Jesus also rejoiced in the salvation that his Father brought through this work. Not only his own salvation from his enemies, but in the work of redemption that the Father had sent him into the world to carry out. One of the things we often don't realize is that Jesus himself was saved, wasn't he? That sounds almost like a, a uh, blasphemous thought and perhaps one that's not fitting of Christ. But remember, our sins were imputed to him and he actually became guilty of our sins. And it was through the discharge of his life on the cross by giving up that life that he actually atoned for that guilt that he was carrying. And so Jesus rejoiced in the work of salvation because in it he was saved from the sins in which he carried. And of course, for performing this work, he also saved his people in his salvation and discharging that guilt which he took upon himself, making himself guilty. In discharging that, he discharged our guilt and has saved us from our sins. That's something that Christ rejoiced in, in your salvation, how greatly he will rejoice. The author to the Hebrews writes that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now Jesus rejoiced in doing this work. He rejoiced in the fact that by uh, taking these sins upon himself, he would save his people. He rejoiced in the fact that the Father would receive his sacrifice and would uh, remove that guilt from him and, and it would be fully discharged. But he also rejoiced in the fact that his Father would be honored because all of these offenses were committed against him. And when Jesus died on the cross for those things, he satisfied his Father's honor fully. The Father could now grant salvation on the basis of what Jesus had done. Now secondly, David writes of how the Father fulfilled Christ's deepest desires in these things, that his work would be completed, his people would be saved, and that he would receive a reward for this work, which would be his people. Verse 2, you have given him his heart's desire, and you have not withheld the request of his lips. Jesus prayed while he was on earth that the Father might save those that he had given him, and that they might one day be able to behold his glory. In John 17, 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. 
the psalmist says that the Messiah would actually rejoice in the fact that he would give him his heart's desire. The Father answered that prayer and granted to Christ that people along with glory and an eternal kingdom and inheritance in the new heavens and the new earth. In other words, he gave all these things to Christ as a reward for his work. Look at verse 3. For you meet him with the blessings of good things. You set a crown of fine gold on his head. The Father not only vindicated the Lord Jesus Christ by raising him from the dead, but he raised him up into heaven, exalted him and crowned him as Lord over all creation. He gave him everything that was promised to him along with us as his reward. Isaiah 53 verses 10 and 11. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. That is, our Lord Jesus Christ would pay a great price for what, uh, for what it is the Father had promised him, but what he would receive for what he had done. He would see it and he would be satisfied. And what he receives, of course, is us, those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, glory, the glory not only, of course, of his eternal divinity, but also the glory which the Father bestows upon the Son for his work, and this eternal kingdom. All of these things Jesus would see and it would satisfy him because it was the desire of his heart. Further, he would receive everlasting life. Verse 4, he asked life of you. You gave it to him length of days forever and ever. We do need to remember that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, didn't he? But the Father gave to him life. He gave to him resurrection life. He gave to him eternal life that being raised now from the dead, he would never return to the grave to see decomposition or corruption. Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10. I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. These are talking about the blessings that the Lord Jesus Christ would receive for his work. And this one blessing of everlasting life is something that Jesus Christ has received not only for himself, but something which the Father has given to him that he might give to us. We do need to remember that as the Lord Jesus Christ receives these blessings, as we've seen in the Sunday school class, that because we have communion with him through faith in him by the Holy Spirit, all of these blessings are being communicated to us and everything that Christ earns, everything that he, that he has acquired through this work, everything that he has seen and is satisfied in, he is satisfied in it not only for himself, but because as our head, he is able to communicate that to us. He is now the one who has life in himself and is able to bestow eternal life upon us. He asked life of you, uh, David says. You gave it to him, length of days forever and ever, and Christ now is able to give that to us. He also gave him glory, verse 5. His glory is great through your salvation, splendor and majesty you place upon him. And again, not just the glory of his being the eternal Son of God, but his glory that he received from his Father for his work and the glory that he would receive from us because we are his, re his reward, we are his people, and we are those who will give him praise and glory throughout eternity. It's one of the things we're, we're doing here this morning by lifting up our praises, by lifting up our prayers, by listening to his word, by thinking now about the things that the Father has given him, the things that the Father has done for him and through him, and by ascribing to him glory and honor and praise, that's a part of the reward, a part of the package that the Father has given to the Son, and the Son sees it, and he is satisfied with that. that that's, a, 
I think a blessed thought, isn't it, that the Lord Jesus Christ receives our praise. We're not just you know, singing and praising and doing all these things in a room that's empty or that, in things that don't go beyond the ceiling. The Lord Jesus Christ from heaven sees these things and they are a blessing to Him and He is satisfied in them. David goes on to say, You gave Him blessing, verse 6, For you make Him most blessed forever. You make Him joyful with gladness in your presence. And again, if we understand what Jonathan Edwards has to say, what this means is that he has given to, the, to Jesus Christ in his presence the fullness of the Holy Spirit as man. Remember, Jesus Christ remains man in heaven. And being now filled with the fullness of God's Spirit, he is filled with his fullness of joy. And this is the same joy that he allows his saints to experience by communicating to us that which is the true riches of heaven. That is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then finally he gave him the blessing, the assurance that nothing in heaven or earth would ever threaten these blessings. Verse 7, For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the loving kindness of the Most High, he will not be shaken. We do need to realize our Lord Jesus Christ in his life, and also through the ministry of his church, has made many enemies. But even as his enemies could not stop him from coming to the throne, as we saw in Psalm 2, even now none of his enemies will ever be able to shake his throne to assault him with any kind of success because the Lord is his protector. And that is why the Lord is able to guarantee to us a kingdom which will never be shaken because his Father has pledged that that kingdom will never be taken away from the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing we see here is that through Christ's exaltation we have received many blessings. Salvation from judgment, obviously. The judgment that was due to our sins. The judgments of hell. The Lord Jesus Christ has delivered us. He has brought about our salvation and He rejoices in the fact that He has saved us from our sins. We have the blessings of an intimate relationship with Christ. We are in communion with Him, members of His body. We are His bride. The Lord Jesus Christ loves us so much, He takes us to be the one that, that uses a relationship to describe that relationship as the very closest one He can imagine, that of a husband to a wife. That's how much the Lord loves us. Jesus has brought for us the blessings of heaven down to us something which no earthly king or president could ever have done for us, although I've already mentioned that if an earthly king would simply submit to the will of God and lead his people in the ways of God, we would certainly see a lot more of that in our nation than we see now. Jesus Christ has actually earned for us and brought for us, bought for us, the whole package. Heaven is ours because of what Jesus Christ has done. So the idea here is that Jesus Christ has been exalted and having been exalted, he has brought many blessings to us because what he did, he did for his people. And if you're trusting in Christ this morning, these are the blessings he has brought down to you. But secondly, we see the blessed hope that one day everything will be subjected to the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, all of Christ's enemies will be punished. One day, all the wrongs will be set right. One day we'll see everything that is wrong in the world brought right again because Jesus Christ is coming again and because the Father has promised that He will subject everything to the Son. Now again, this should give us great confidence going into this because the world is not going to overcome Christ. Everything that has happened to us in this world is, is going to be corrected by Christ. All the evil that we see is going to be abolished. One day everlasting righteousness will be brought in and it will be brought in because of the work of Christ and because of what the Father has promised him. In Psalm 110 verse 1 we have this statement, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Right now Christ is at his right hand and his enemies are being subjected to him. First of all let's look at verse 8 where the Lord says that he will discover or find out all who are his son's enemies. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. And what's he going to do with them once 
He finds them. Verse 9, You will make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord will swallow them up in His wrath and fire will devour them. Now I believe the imagery here is certainly the imagery that is used referring to everlasting destruction, referring to hell. If Christ's enemies do not repent, if they do not submit to Him but continue to uh, rebel and, and commit evil acts against Him, He will pour out His wrath upon them. As we saw in Psalm 2 already, verses 10 through 12. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that He not become angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Now, like I said, this is a, a part of the Scripture that is very unpalatable to the world. And even many professing believers don't like to hear these things, don't like to talk about these things, don't like to think about these things. They like to think about God as purely a, a God of love, and that's all He does is distribute love to the world. And He would never do anything like this because it seems to be contrary to love. But we do need to remember that God loves Himself more than anyone else. And He loves His honor. And He is a just God. And He cannot violate His justice. He cannot violate His honor. Those who, who continue to rebel and sin against Him and refuse to submit to Him to what is right and to what is good, who continue in their wickedness and evil, He must judge them. And it is good that He judge them. They are to submit to Him because that is the right thing to do. And if they do not do this, and if they continue in their rebellion, He will cast them into hell for their rebellion. As a matter of fact, it goes even beyond that. Look at verse 10. Their offspring you will destroy from the earth, and their descendants from among the sons of men. In other words, God's wrath is not limited just to those individuals who rebel against Him but also to their offspring. We need to remember that in the Scripture there is a strong emphasis on what's called covenant solidarity. That is, God views a people that are bound together in, with whatever you know, relationship they might have as a unit. He saw Israel as one people, not as individuals. He sees the church as one body. He sees families as one group, as one family. And so oftentimes families would either be blessed together or they would be cursed together depending upon what the heads of those households would do. Family connections. You want an example? Look at what Adam did to his family. Okay. But on the other hand, Abraham. Look at what the Lord blessed him with because of his faithfulness to the Lord. And again, that's only because of the Lord's mercy. How his household was blessed. Look at how Noah's household was blessed. On the other hand, look at how Achan's was cursed because of his sin. Or those uh, officials in in Babylon that accused Daniel falsely. They, their families, and everything that belonged to their household was thrown into the lion's den because of their crimes. Again, that's because of the solidarity of the family unit. Well, the Lord says here that if a man is going to be wicked, God will visit his judgment not just upon him, but upon his descendants. Remember how the, in the commandments we're talk, it talks about how those who who will not honor the Lord, he, how God visits upon the third and the fourth generations, upon those who hate Him, His judgments. But yet He shows loving kindness to thousands of generations, to those who love Him and keep His commandments. Now, we have to bear in mind that God is not punishing the children for the sins of their fathers because that's something God specifically said He will not do. But we do remember, need to remember as well that God only... I mean, God shows mercy or withholds mercy sovereignly from anyone, and uh, the, the, uh, God can, can do that on the basis of the head of the household. If the head of the household is wicked, God may choose not to show mercy to anyone down the line and just simply judge them all for their sins. That's what he's saying here. Their offspring you will destroy from the earth and their descendants from among the sons of men. And again, we're reminded in verse 11, even though they may attempt to overthrow the Son, they will fail. Though they intended evil against you and devised a plot, they will not succeed. 
They could not stop Jesus from coming to the throne. They cannot overthrow Him once He is on the throne. The Lord is absolutely sovereign and His sovereignty is going to extend over the whole world and it's either going to be, of course, by willing submission or it's going to be by forced subjection and those that will not subject themselves, God will destroy. Again, look at verse 12. For you will make them turn their back you will aim with your bowstrings at their faces. All of Christ's enemies are going to be defeated. One day they're all going to be subjected under his feet. Now remember that all of Christ's enemies are also your enemies because if you are Christ and you're on his side, the world hates you as it hates him. Those who are of the world, those who are going to perish with the world are, are enemies. They're the ones who persecute you. They're the ones who hate you because you are like the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, or actually David says through the Spirit of Christ that one day all of those enemies are going to be destroyed in his wrath, meaning all of our enemies will also be defeated. Christ won this victory when he overcame the devil on the cross. One day every knee will submit to him. The Lord will overcome all of his enemies and all the enemies of his Son. Now we do need to remember though, on the other hand, that this happens in one of two ways. It can happen in this way that we've just read about, in the way that we don't like to think about, in God's pouring out of His wrath to those who, who are recalcitrant, who are incorrectable, those who will not repent, those who will not turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. But He also subdues them in another way that we need to remember that is a much more gracious way. And that is He changes their hearts by His Holy Spirit through the preaching of the Gospel. Those are the two ways in which the Lord subdues all men to Himself. He either wins their hearts over so that they willingly submit to Him or He subjects them by force because in their wickedness of their hearts they refuse to. Now realizing that those are the two different ways in which the Lord does this and that those are the two ultimate outcomes of everyone's life in the world I think should give us an encouragement first of all again that no matter what evil takes place in the world, God's going to right it. But on the other hand, it should encourage us to reach out with the gospel. You know, you think about all those people that you know that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ that I hope we care about. People I hope that we love at some level, right? That we, we want to see them saved. And yet we know that there's really nothing lovely in them. There's nothing of Christ in them. There's no holiness... No, no righteousness, nothing that we can really attach a holy affection to, but it doesn't mean we don't care about them. We do. The Lord tells us we ought to care about all men, but especially those that we're bound together with in families. You know, children that may not know Christ, or more extended family members, or people that we're even friends with at one time, maybe even before we came to Christ. We, we care about them. We should care about them. And realizing that these, you know, one of the two, these things are going to happen to them, they're either going to be, you know, face God's wrath because they refuse to repent or that they might be saved through the gospel. How should we be trying to reach them then with that gospel, not being concerned about how they may respond to us? I think that's one of the main things that gets in our way. We don't want them to hate us. We don't want to be ostracized from our families. We don't want to be, you know, those that, that are always avoided and those that when we get there, everybody kind of turns away because they don't want to spend time with us. We don't like rejection, do we? And we don't like it when people get angry at us and blow up in our faces and say nasty things to us that we don't want to hear. Uh, there's a lot of things like that, I think, that are getting in the way of our telling people about Christ and, and also the idea that people in, in today's world are going to think we're very foolish because you know science has told us God doesn't exist and we all evolved you know, just accidentally and we came from apes and all this other kind of stuff. And they're going to look at us as fools for believing that you know, a creator with infinite intelligence and power actually made everything, made us in his image, and, and there are rules that we are to follow. And we are to love him and honor him and glorify him. Now, which of those two worldviews do you think is the most reasonable? They may consider us to be fools, but we're not fools, right? We hold the truth. We know the truth. And we know that unless we communicate that gospel to them, and unless they receive it and receive Christ and turn from their sins, they are going to face the wrath of God. 
This passage, again, it does encourage us that God's enemies will be destroyed, but we've got to remember some of those enemies may very well be people close to us, and we need to do everything we can to try to save them before that time comes. If we haven't reached out and communicated the gospel to them, we need to do that. The death of my uncle reminds me that time runs out. He was 89 years old, and he rejected He's heard the gospel before. He's rejected it, but... You know, maybe there's always that possibility at the end that they might come to Christ, but they need to be encouraged, they need to be exhorted, they need to be uh, exposed to the gospel again, and we need to pray for them. We need to do everything we can to try to bring them to faith before God's wrath should be poured out, which one day it will. Time will be up. The Lord will either require their life and take their life off out of this world, their soul away, and cast it into hell, Okay, or he'll come in that flaming judgment at the end where he gathers all the nations together and divides the sheep from the goats. And on that day, by God's grace, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're among, numbered among the sheep, but who do you think we're going to see numbered among the goats? There's going to be people in that group that we cared about, but hopefully nobody that uh, was ignorant of the gospel, people we could have reached but we didn't reach, that day is going to happen. It's going to come. Just like, uh, again, other things that we seem to think are never going to happen in our lives, that they're so far off. You know, for children, sometimes it's when I'm going to get my license so I can drive a car. It just seems like it takes so long to reach that age to get there. Or, uh, you know, if you're, if you're engaged to be married and, and that, um, you know, the marriage, uh, the wedding ceremony is up there, it just seems like it's going to take so long to get to it and so forth. But those days come. Or when you're expecting a child and the child's finally born, you know, sometimes it seems like it's going to take forever. Those times do finally arrive and then they pass. Well, this time is coming. And one day it is going to be here. And the day of our death is going to be here too. Uh, perhaps very shortly, perhaps a few years off. But it is going to come. That time is going to be here and our opportunity is going to be over. It's going to be gone. As well as the opportunity we have to reach some of our loved ones that may die before we reach them. In recognition of all these things, again, the elections that are coming up and the need for a righteous king, the fact that we do have a righteous king and he is ruling and reigning in righteousness and he is going to hold all men accountable, we need to be encouraged that you know, God has given to us this Christ and, and we need to do what we can to reach out to others to save them. There's, there's great encouragement on the one hand with regard to the state of our nation. There's great urgency on the other hand with the fact that there's people who still need to be reached, but there, again, there's, there's great um, closure at the end when Christ is going to right all of those wrongs. So thinking about all of these things, we just, let's just look at this concluding remark in verse 13. And this is the response of David to the Lord for these blessings to himself, and undoubtedly the response of the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessings that the Father has bestowed upon him. And it should be our response that God has given to us so righteous a king. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. When the psalmist David looked at this, he didn't say, oh, what a horrible thing, what a horrible king, the fact he's going to judge people and right all these wrongs, but this is something he rejoiced in. Lord, you are, you are great. Be exalted in your strength. You wield your strength righteously. Everything you do is above reproach. The people that you judge, des uh, they deserve to be judged righteously. That's a good thing. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. We should praise the Lord because he is worthy of our praise. We should praise him because of the greatness of the power that he exerts in holy and righteous ways bringing down these many benefits that we've already seen to us. But we should also praise Him in that one day He will defeat all His and our enemies. One thing that we uh, don't often think about, but was uh, something brought out uh, at one time, one of my seminary professors. Right now the Lord tells us that we are to love our enemies and do what we can to minister to them and, and try to reach out to them with the gospel. But there's going to come a time when... when uh, Basically, God's going to come. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. And everyone's going to be gathered for judgment. And they're going to be judged. And they're going to be cast into the eternal fire. And on that day, we're not going to weep. But we're going to rejoice. Because God's enemies are being punished. Now, we don't know, ultimately, who are going to turn out to be his enemies or his friends. You know, only God knows those whom he's chosen. And we hope 
that he has chosen many from among those that we you know, are praying for that they might be saved. So we need to do everything we can to reach them now while we can, but realize on that day when that happens, we're not going to be, we're not going to be upset. As John Gerster once said that he believes when he reaches heaven and by God's grace, if he should reach heaven, he said, and, and he there would discover that his mother was, was unconverted and that she was suffering in hell. He believed that his sanctification would be so great at that time and his love for Christ so filled with the Spirit that he would be able to see his mother in, in her suffering and pain and unimaginable torment and glorify God for his justice. That's something R.C. Sproul, when he said he heard Kirstner say that, he said, I almost died. You know, but uh, again, that's pretty heavy stuff. But that's the way it's going to be. People we care about, people we love, are not going to be in heaven, but are going to be suffering in hell. Heaven beholds hell. On that day, it will not give us grief, but we'll be able to rejoice in that. Otherwise, we'd be crying throughout all eternity as we see people we love suffering, right? But we're not going to because they're God's enemies. Anything that might have been desirable about them has been removed because God has removed all of his goodness from them. And now they're being punished justly for their sins and God is glorified and that will rejoice. But that isn't the way it is right now. That's the way it will be then. But in light of that, we can praise God. We can praise Him for His strength and sing and praise His power because He exercises it righteously and justly. Everything God does is good. Absolutely everything. And that should give us great confidence. But let's spend a few moments in prayer now. Let's ask the Lord to take these things and uh, to help us apply them to our lives, to encourage us. But especially, I hope, to, um, I think, sort of push us forward in trying to reach others with the gospel while we still have those opportunities. Let's spend a few moments in prayer.